All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the final day of August. Hopefully fall is close behind. This is Jason Leva with the Fort Worth Community Arts Center welcoming you to another episode of Boxed Lunch. Hoping everybody is doing well out there and ready for another holiday quickly approaching. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a fabulous artist with us today. So very excited. Please help us in welcoming the one and only Daryl Ratcliffe today. How are you doing today, Daryl? I'm doing well, Jason. Hello, everyone. I'm just super happy to be here with you um, on this lunch break. And uh, yeah, doing well. Well, we are... eat, gonna... <laughs> well we are so very grateful, Daryl, for you to uh, uh, take the time to join us and have lunch with us today on, uh, on our wonderful uh, 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 viewing here on Facebook Live. And uh, before we get started, do you mind just uh, introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do? Great. Uh, my name is Daryl Ratcliffe. I'm an artist and poet based in Dallas, Texas. Um, Co-founder of Ash Studios with Fred Villanueva. That's a supported artist of color since 2012 in the uh, Fair Park, South Dallas, Old East Dallas, Deep Ellum area. Um, also co-founder of Michelada Think Tank, an art collective that's in um, LA, San Diego, New York, and Dallas, um, as well as Creating Our Future, um, that has uh, helped artists advocate for themselves to municipal governments. Uh, lately, though, I'm really excited about co-founding a company, Gossipian Investments, with Maya Crawford. And uh, now our team of eight people are working um, really across the country and even world right now to kind of evolve the role of culture in society and really think about um, what is the artist's role for the future. Very good. And nice. I themes and I write for the Dallas Morning News. <laughs> you just you throw that off like it's you know just your your side gig little side hustle there writing as well so <laughs> you're not busy at all it sounds like so um, we're, we're just so grateful to have you Daryl and uh, so very excited to uh, uh, hear some of the wonderful stuff that you've got going on indeed. It's uh, uh, so important and relevant at the moment and we will get to that in just a little bit. But first and foremost, I was curious if you wouldn't mind discussing what is on your lunch menu today and some of the wonderful ingredients that you're using to create it. Okay, so, you know, I, I think the first word that people think of when they think of Daryl Radcliffe is patriot. So I thought the most important thing to do would be to do the all-American hot dog. Um, <laughs> so I am going to be making uh, hot dogs. Um, you know, we're going to use for condiments the classic Frenchies yellow mustard. Um, some Heinz tomato ketchup. But then one's going to be, we're going to try to maybe get a little, little fancy with some spicy brown mustard on one. A little, uh, little relish. Woo! Uh, I think I'm going to chop up, chop up some onions on that spicy brown one. And, um, you know, going to use a beef brain. Um, and some fresh buns. So that's, uh, I, that's what we're doing. Maybe, maybe throw some chips on there and, uh, and call it a, call it a day. Well, uh, Kismet has struck what about you? in. I, I guess it is, it's hot dog day. So uh, I am, uh, I am falling in line there. We did not plan this prior to the interview. It's just the way of the world you sometimes, did. I think. So yeah. I am also going with a hot dog today. Uh, my hot dog is a spicy jalapeno chicken sausage. If anybody's paying attention to the box lunch series, I'm uh, uh, attempting <laughs> at times to 
to eat a little healthier. And so uh, this is my, uh, <laughs> my poor attempt today to, uh, to have somewhat of a healthy hot dog as well. So uh, I'm going to follow your lead. And I'm going with the uh, ever classic gray poupon today. So I'll be uh, putting a little oh, bit of that oh. on there. I've also got my uh, hot dog buns, but they just don't look very well. They actually kind of got mashed in there. So I'll, I'll do my best to uh, bring some life and <laughs> possibly some art creation to my, uh, my presentation as well. And uh, I'm actually quite excited about the sausage. They're not too bad. I had, uh, had one earlier in the weekend and uh, it was so good that I figured I'd try it again. Trader Joe's spicy jalapeno chicken sausage. So uh, I'm gonna heat up my pan. I'm assuming you'll get started yeah. on yours. And Daryl will just jump yeah. right into this. And while you're uh, getting things prepped up, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind talking just a little bit about uh, discussing the challenges of creating art during this COVID-19 pandemic? Sure. I mean, I would say one of the biggest challenges is really mental capacity. Um, when you have so much going on in the world, uh, so much to really be constantly, you know, traumatized by in a way. Um, as we're in a time of great grief, I think, for many people um, and, uh, and kind of this collective grief. I think as a lot of many creatives, myself included, are, are, are sensitive. We're, we're sensitive to, we're empathetic. And so when there's a lot of people hurting, a lot of people angry, um, I think we, we feel that and can kind of internalize that. And I think sometimes it can make it uh, difficult to figure out, you know, what should I be doing right now? I think a lot of creatives, including myself, have, have asked, you know, is, is what I'm doing enough? Is, is art what I even should be doing right now? Um, where there's all these things going on in the world. And so I think um, uh, having to deal with that and kind of dig in and like ask those internal questions um, particularly in a time where it's also economically challenging for many artists, you know, um, and you really have to ask yourself, why, why am I doing this? Why is this who I am? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, debate and, uh, and talk about, about artists should be writing the next great novel or the, uh, uh, the next great screenplay during all of this downtime. As an artist yourself, um, are you finding uh, inspiration and, uh, and muse coming to you to create artistically in this situation? Or do you find yourself still kind of absorbing all of the stuff that is going on? I know myself as an artist, it's hard to sit down and put paper to pen because it just seems like every day something else is coming full speed at us. And uh, I'm finding it a little bit more difficult to actually create. It seems like the majority of my time has really just been sent, uh, spent trying to absorb all of this information that's coming at us. Yeah. Um... It's difficult for sure. Like I was thinking, uh, I was talking to a curator Friday and I was like, wow, I realized uh, I was fortunate to get um, a Nasher Sculpture Center artist grant uh, this, this year. And I was thinking, man, I have not started on this project <laughs> yet. Because, you know, like, and the idea uh, was kind of an older idea, but like just kind of wanting to creatively just dive into something, um, you know, it's been, I think, a little bit, a little bit harder, particularly, I think right now I'm balancing a lot of time things as well. But um, so I'm getting a lot of energy for like other parts of how I show up in the world. But, um, but creatively, I feel like it's only been the last two weeks on a personal level that I think I've started like moving uh, in the world as a creative again. 
um, started reaching out to some of my creative partners and kind of being like, all right, I think it's time to start making some art. Uh, shout out to Chrissy Bidge. We, we started, uh, we put our team together again that created Dallas and Remix and uh, started working on kind of part two of that project uh, just last week. So it's been all that to say is like, it's been a lot because when I first, when things first started happening, my mind just went to triage, like what can be done to like help people live. Um, and, um, and then kind of started moving. I kind of, I feel like I've been in that mode for a little while of like, what can I do that like just immediately helps and like helping, you know, hopefully save some lives um, in this time. But I think the art will come. Like I'm never worried <laughs> about the art coming, like the art will come. And so like, I don't think anyone should be pressured for the art to come right now. Like if it does for you, that's great. You know, like that's, that's awesome. Like don't feel bad <laughs> if things are coming to you. Um, but if it's not coming to you yet, like don't feel bad about that either because it will come. Yeah, absolutely. I know a lot of people have talked about um, writer's block in the past. Do you feel like that there is uh, such a thing as a as writer's bloat? <laughs> <laughs> writer's bloat. <laughs> well, I feel like there's stuff. I don't know. I don't know about writer's bloat. I feel like there's information bloat. There's like, uh, you know, is we're already living in kind of like intention economy where we're just bombarded with, you know, uh, all the more information than any human has ever had to process ever. You know, it's like kind of where we, where we live um, and the times that we live in. And so I think it's really hard to like know, A, it's sometimes hard to even know what's real like what information you're receiving that's actually factual and real. It's hard to know that, um, I think more than ever. And, and then there's so much of things that we do know is real, but it's just so much. Like what should you care about? When should you care about it? Like is, I think, I think is, I think we do have like a bloat of information and that, that makes it really easy to feel paralyzed and not able to move forward. Sure. Daryl, I'm curious as an artist yourself, how do you compartmentalize that? How are you able to step away and focus that creation? Or do you just open the door and, and let it flow and see what comes out? Um, that's a great question. I know I personally, I work in spirals. Like that's kind of my workflow. So like I'll, and, and those spirals now I can see, take place over years. <laughs> and so um, I'm laughing because I was talking to, uh, talking to a friend and we're revisiting a project that, you know, we started in 2016 and never like, com we didn't complete it the way that we intended it to complete it, right? And so, uh, you know, it's like, okay, like this is spiraling back. Okay, maybe now we're going to like kind of really finish this project in the way it deserves. And so I think for me, that helps, uh, that's been helpful and that I don't feel a lot of pressure or I've taken a lot of pressure off myself in terms of um, like, this has to get done now. Um, and like trying to surrender to the belief, it will get done. Um, it might not get done when I think it's gonna get done, but like I've seen how like my work and ideas like they're fairly, I shouldn't say consistent, but like the things I care about are the things I care about. And so they, they come back like, you know, even if I don't write a poem, I realized I hadn't written a poem since the pandemic started, for example. And I was just like, but that doesn't mean I'm not a poet. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to write poems <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Um, it'll just come back around when it's meant to come back around. Yeah, on that same note. I don't know if that answers the question. But. <laughs> um, Daryl, what have you learned about yourself as an artist during all of this crazy time? So, 
One, I learned um, that I'm okay not being around a lot of people. Like, I, I think a lot of people were very concerned for me at the beginning of this thing because I'm so social and so like, and my work is often about gathering people together in interesting ways. Like, that's like a core of my aesthetic. And to be in a place where one can't gather, it's like, oh, how, how, is, how am I going to do things? Um, and so, but I was like, okay, it let me get into a different part of myself. Um, and I used to tell people that like, I tested intro like introvert for a long time. And then around college at some point it switched to extrovert, but that like that introvert is like, it's, it's there, it's there. And so I think this time let me kind of get into that, get into that mode, um, which I appreciated. Um, and yeah, so I would say that's like kind of been the biggest learning of like that there's an energy that I can tap into when I slow down, uh, even though I've been getting a lot of my energy from being around people. Um, so it's nice to know like that there's access to both of those forms of energy. I'm, I'm curious, has it, has it changed the, uh, the tone of your poetry? Um, or are you still finding yourself uh, uh, focusing on the uh, same narratives that you uh, uh, considered prior to all of this? Has your perception changed about what you think uh, is important to be uh, expressing artistically? Um, hmm. Well, I would say yes, because I realized I kind of misspoke when I said I hadn't written anything. Um, that, in fact, um, I, I, I hadn't. I had done a, a commission piece. Um, and it was really, there's this group I work with called Spark and Echo, which is based in uh, New York City. And they, uh, their mission is to illuminate the, the Bible. And so they commission with contemporary art. So they commission various artists in all disciplines to, um, you know, kind of take a verse from the Bible, whether you're Christian, non-Christian, atheist, whatever, and make a piece of art inspired by that. Um, and so, and so I, I did, and it was, you know, kind of, this is my second time working with them. And both times were like, the product was, it's very different. Because, you know, normally I think I, I write a lot about being in love. Um, because, you know, why be a poet if you aren't going to write about love? But, um, but you know, like, uh, the first one I did actually wrote a lot about Black Lives Matter. And in this one, I wrote about uh, caregiving to a relative who was, who was um, you know, towards the end stages of their life. And, and kind of, you know, that experience and that mystery um, of uh, grace and life and passing. And so I do, I will say that there's been something about the pandemic that for me personally has um, kind of spiraled back to, around to a lot of kind of spirituality and, you um, and thinking about those, those things and those topics, which, you know, how can you not, once again, when, you know, like people are constantly going through grief, there's so much passing and so much death. Um, it kind of forces you, I think, to think about like, you know, those bigger questions. Yeah, absolutely. About, you know, why are we here? And, you know. Yeah. I I find it really interesting that um, <clears throat> when uh, we've gone through all of this uh, uh, sheltering and all of these things that have been happening to us, um, I find it very, very interesting that a lot of people uh, um, have been looking inward and having to deal outward. And uh, it's, it's almost uh, 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 an oxymoron to be taking care of yourself and uh, uh, socially distancing, uh, 
uh, wearing masks, all of these things that are uh, uh, individualized. And yet, uh, what a struggle it is to continue to look outward. And so uh, I, I always find it interesting. It just seems like um, uh, a, a very hard balance to find for a lot of people. And I wonder um, if that might have something to do with why we can't seem to uh, uh, communicate very well with each other. And uh, I find it very interesting that everybody's trying to uh, be so aware outwardly and so um, protective uh, inward. And so uh, it's just really interesting to talk to all of these artists and see where that muse is coming from. Um, do you find that art is looking outward or do you find for yourself that it's looking inward? Where does that come from? I mean, I guess for me that relates back to the extrovert introvert uh, kind of energy thing because they can be both. You know, I, I um, uh, would talk a lot uh, about, you know, how kind of growing up uh, the, the rappers Tupac and Biggie were kind of not just besides being great rappers were just really kind of to me examples of, you know, Tupac, a lot of his lyrics, I would say were looking out like he's talking about the things around around him um and they're kind of these bigger anthems um and then biggie's like talking oh, he's usually talking very inward very precise very like this is this is what's going on in my life like this isn't what's going on in a community this is like what i am dealing with and so it's very kind of introverted in that way and and how like both of those paths, I think, lead to the same place, which is, you know, art at its best, I think, touches on universal truth. And so, so I, I think all that to say is like, for me, I get inspiration from both places. Like, like I'm really, I respond, I'm, I'm a responder. Um, and so, you know, it's like, I see something and my first instinct is to like, oh, we got to do, I got to do something or we got to do something or like who can fix this or who can make this um, better. And so, so I do get kind of, I guess, inspiration from, from like the world, particularly when the world is, you know, fucked up. I'm just like, ah, oh, that's terrible. Who wants to live like this? <laughs> what can we do to like make it less 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 messed up and but then like there's a just super personal like i don't think anyone cares about this <laughs> but i care and like this is this is like the stupid thing that made me cry and 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 i think that's what i love about being an artist is that you know you have this license to be selfish and I think like the best artists are selfish and like, and we think of selfishness as a negative thing, but I don't think it has to be. Is is the like, I am like, I am doing this thing because I need to do it. And I'm happy whenever other people care about it. And if that's two people, three people, thousands of people, millions of people, that's great. But I would still do it <laughs> even if all those other people weren't there uh, because it's what I want to do and and to me that's that's freedom very nice very nice yeah uh, uh, I, I'm just always so uh, inspired and interested to hear how artists create where that muse comes from and uh, and what it is that 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 pushes us forward it seems to be you know a little different for everybody and so uh, so I, I ask those questions, you know, just because I'm just so curious what, uh, what moves you as an artist. Well, what, so I, I have a question. When did, when did you start, like, when did you know that this was, like, what you wanted to do? Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, years ago. <laughs> I, I don't know if I knew I had to do it. I just simply couldn't stop doing it. And it started for me as a, uh, uh, a way to place my feelings and uh, uh, 
the things that I was trying to cope with. Uh, it just didn't uh, serve me well to run down the street, street screaming when I was upset about something. But luckily, I found theater, uh, a script where it said right there, character runs down the road screaming. And I thought, oh my goodness, what a great way to uh, uh, express myself <laughs> without everybody staring at me for all the wrong reasons. I'm not sure I made the decision. I think it was just something that I continued to do and uh, 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 carried on with and luckily uh, was able to continue to find outlets that allowed me to uh, uh, pursue it. And uh, I, 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 I say very often, I, I don't think I chose art. I think art chose me. And um, I really do feel at times like a lot of it's not even my creation. I'm just kind of a vessel that it transfers through. And, uh, and so there was a lot of stuff out of just uh, sheer necessity. I grew up on a, a, an isolated area where I didn't have the access to a lot of uh, uh, things to entertain me. And so a lot of that came just out of uh, pure uh, necessity of needing an outlet. And it just happened to be imagination, uh, opportunity, and then here I found myself many, many years later uh, doing that same thing because it, it brought something to me at an early age. Yeah, yeah, no, same. And I definitely resonate with the, with the art chose me. Um, and, you know, I was, I was pretty, I think, privileged, very privileged in terms of um, kind of access uh, arts. Um, I, the first poem that like I have memory of as being a poem, I think was like kindergarten or first grade. Um, and then like, I feel like I started writing about art as a freshman in high school. And that was kind of the same time I first felt like I was going to be a visual artist. Um, because I started, that's when I started to learn how to paint uh, for real. And shout out to Roberto Munguia, a uh, great artist uh, uh, who shows that conduit. And then, um, and then also because of that, and, um, and the fact that Nancy's son was in my class growing up, you know, it's like I grew up from a young age going to galleries and, and kind of looking at contemporary art. And so, so in many ways, I'm truly grateful that I can say, like, I am just doing what I've always done, like, for almost as far back as I can remember. Um, this is, I've been a person who's created things. And so I think that's part of when I say, like, I don't have, I try not to have so much anxiety around it. And because it's like, oh, well, this is just, like, who you are. Yep. Um, I am interested, though, in like all the different ways that can come out because I don't think it has to be restricted to like specific form or specific discipline. Um, I'm really interested in how artists can take that thing that makes them need to create, that makes them need to like solve a problem, um, make the world beautiful, or just deal with their own trauma, um, how that can occur in like other parts of life that don't normally include artists. Yeah, it's a, uh, a, a very, very uh, uh, tangled web of inspiration. I'm sure that uh, if you asked a hundred artists, they'd probably all have a different response as to uh, uh, how they move through that process. So, all right, speaking of process, I know that we may not have the most intricate lunch menus planned today, but I'm still curious, how are your hot dogs coming along? Do you boil them or do you use the uh, pan frying method? Well, so I, I, I use the grill. I use like a little kind of mini like George Foreman type grill. Um, and, and I think they came out great. In fact, let me see if we can- Oh my it. gosh, you're already done? <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. Holy cow, it looks delicious. You just like magically whipped that up. <laughs> well, I thought that was the point while we were talking. <laughs> I'm still still heating mine up in the skillet. I'm not even ready. I guess I'm going to have to ask some more questions. So, (laughs) hey, Daryl, it's my understanding that you guys have a a really neat uh, uh, initiative coming to uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I was curious if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about um, the COVID Take Six initiative that is uh, out and around now in the DFW area. Hmm. You know, I've always wanted to eat a hot dog on like a live (laughs) video platform. So thank you, Jason, for making this a reality. Um, (laughs) uh, Carrie Mae Weems is, um, I think, one of, the most fantastic artists working in um, in our country right now, and um, and she um, you know she's won a MacArthur Award. Was the first uh, black artist to show at the have a retrospective at the Guggenheim, and she is based in New York, currently in Syracuse, New York. And so, as you know, New York was uh, one of the areas in our country that was hardest hit by COVID in the beginning. And so um, she did what artists do, which is respond (laughs) to things. And so she was really concerned about how COVID was affecting communities of color because, I mean, you can get all host of reasons, but one is just uh, underlying conditions uh, or more prevalent health conditions in uh, communities of color. And And so there's been a disproportionate rate that uh, people of color have been dying from COVID. And she wanted to make sure that communities of color and specifically were taking into account like the need to be safe and take this very seriously. So she made, uh, she's a photographer, media artist. So she uh, made pictures, made kind of these um, things that can take the shape of billboards, of yard signs, of um, uh, church fans, uh, grocery bags um, with different imagery and messages from hopeful messages like don't worry we will all hold hands again or you know life is beautiful um, to messages are thanking essential workers who don't have who didn't have the luxury of staying at home or sheltering at home um, and thanking them for, you know, really putting their lives at risk to keep our our country and society going to practical, you know, kind of health messaging, you know, take the take sits refers to the six feet distance that we're supposed to be maintaining. And um, so, you know, like wash your hands, wear masks, (laughs) um, you know, stay six feet apart. And for her, I think one of the impetus was that since this is all so new, that we do need reminders. We do need visual reminders um, to because we spent our whole lives not having to wear masks, not having to stay six feet apart. So it only makes sense that like, you know, kind of like, you know, there's stop signs and there's speed <laughs> limit signs. Like there should be signs, uh, imagery that's like reminding us of what we're supposed to do. Um, and so we've, so, once she made that project, she was thinking about it being in different parts of the country. And uh, Lori Farrell, who's a senior contem- senior curator at the Dallas Contemporary, had worked with Carrie Mae Weems on a project uh, at SCAD and got in touch. And uh, Lori kind of asked, thought it would be great if multiple institutions worked together to present this as kind of a united front. And um, so there's a cultural consortium that includes um, the Dallas Contemporary, um, Dallas Museum of Art, National Sculpture Center, African American Museum of Dallas, uh, Crow Museum of uh, Asian Art, the Eamon Carter 
the Fort Worth Modern and, um, and my new uh, company, Group of Cultural Consultants, uh, Gossipian Investments. And so the eight of our institutions are uh, presenting uh, this project. Right now, there are eight billboards that are up, four in Fort Worth, four in Dallas. This Friday is kind of our second wave. And so there will be 30 additional billboards that go up between the two different cities. Um, we also have materials that we're going to be distributing. So we're partnering with food banks, uh, like the Tar Tarrant Area Food Bank, the um, uh, North Texas Food Bank to uh, distribute grocery bags with kind of images in it. Uh, we also got a uh, PP, uh, PPE masks that will be included in that. Um, uh, we'll have yard signs. We're going to kind of wheat paste. There's uh, 50 community, over 50 community partners uh, between both cities who are working with this project to really help it get to the places and the people who need it the most. Um, and we organize that by looking at like the zip code hotspots between um, uh, COVID hotspots between both cities and really targeting those areas uh, with the messaging. Wow, that's just absolutely incredible. I'm curious, um, was why Dallas, Fort Worth? Was it because of counts and numbers? Or uh, uh, were we just fortunate to be able to get this wonderful uh, artist into this area? That was that was a good one. Um, so, so um, I think it was kind of both things. I think it was a the relationship that uh, Lori had with Carrie. Um, you know, I think that was kind of critical to being particularly one of the early cities with the project. Um, and then I would say it made a lot of sense because you know as because this has happened very quickly, clearly. Um, you know, I think we came together for the first time, you know, maybe the second week of June, um, just to hear about the idea. So, you know, here we are in September and to, you know, kind of get eight institutions to work together for the first time, plus 50 community partners, plus, you know, all this stuff in like a couple months has been, uh, it's been, it's been a real sprint, but um, but I think what made the project work here was that everyone was clear on the need um, and the need for this messaging at this time in our communities um, to help keep everyone safe, um, uh, which is, yeah, kind of super important. So, you know, I think the reasoning was even if this could help, you know, uh, present prevent the spread, prevent any loss of life, you know, then, then it's worth it. It's, it's totally worth it. Absolutely. And, uh, and you said that this is not necessarily uh, an art installation, so to speak, meaning the art isn't just in one building. It's all over. You talked about yard signs, billboards. Um, how do people uh, uh, find this stuff? Is, is it just luck of the draw, driving by a billboard? Is there a website or any kind of uh, uh, mapping where people have the ability to uh, uh, seek it out? Yes, so, so every institution that's involved, they have um, a tab on their page um, that has the uh, project information. Um, next, hopefully by next week, um, we'll have a map available um, that we've been working on that will have all the billboard locations, um, any of the wheat paste locations. We're really excited that the uh, Fort Worth Community Art Center is going to have an exhibition uh, kind of in conjunction with this project. And so, um, and so that's great because that'll be an opportunity for folks to actually to go to a place to see uh, everything, but you know, I think kind of people have been enjoying opportunities that they can drive around and see art. 
And so there's um, about four four different billboards, and every and everything we're doing is bilingual. Um, so there's English and Spanish versions of um, of everything. Um, so yeah, so hopefully people will be able to kind of drive around and uh, check out the work near them. Very nice. That is absolutely awesome. So I'm curious. <clears throat> Uh, now, this is a, a, a great resource in terms of awareness in uh, 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 keeping people as safe as we possibly can. What other helpful community resources are you seeing or using personally as an artist? And um, how can your organization or the many organizations that you're associated with provide assistance or what kind of assistance do you need to help other artists and organizations? Yeah, that's 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 the ecosystem question, <laughs> and um, and honestly, you know, it's like I I you know I had the pleasure of um, living and spending a lot of time in Fort Worth um, in 2018, and so I draw you know I think a lot of inspiration for how Fort Worth in particular, as a community, I think cares for their artists in a way that, um, that I believe Dallas uh, has, has some things to learn from. And so even in, um, if you look at the response to the pandemic, um, you know, like I, as an individual, I launched an artist relief fund and, uh, you know, just for some immediate triage and, you know, like very happy and proud of folks, you know, who donated. Um, I think we raised over $14,000 that we gave out. Wow. Um, however, it took months before any institutional uh, folks kind of stepped up to the plate and uh, shout out to Dallas Aurora, um, who is doing artist grants, but that, but even that, both of those initiatives, I think, kind of held in scope to uh, kind of the Fort Worth response to supporting artists through the through the pandemic. So, all that to say is like um, the data that's been gathered shows that you know um, I think statewide it's over a billion dollars. I know in Dallas. There's over $68 million reported in losses, 1,200 jobs. And, you know, a lot of artists will work in culture and culture-related fields, you know, as a means to support themselves. And so, so all of this is just really hitting hard economically on artists. Um, and so I think one thing that is needed is folks need to continue to... Um, be creative, and that might mean working together. That might mean institutions that haven't partnered, but might have similar things um, need to kind of pull their resources more, um, so that so that we can we can kind of get through this. Because I don't think we've really felt truly the uh, full economic impact that this is going to ha have. And I think it's it'll be. Um, more severe this fall than it has been this summer from an economic standpoint. Uh, one thing that my company, my new company is trying to do to help with the ecosystem is, is making investments. Um, and so we have a fund that's up right now. If you go to our website, www.gascipian.com uh, called the Grace Fund. And the Grace Fund is uh, making investments in a range of $100 to $1,000 um, and ideas of uh, artists and cultural workers. Um, and, you know, it's a pretty simple one-page form application uh, where, you know, I think you just ask three questions. What is your idea? Why are you the person to do it? And how are you going to make money from it? And if... Um, and we evaluate, we're evaluating those things on a rolling basis and then uh, providing funding and then um, kind of other support that we have in our networks uh, to help those people succeed. So that's, uh, that's one way that, you know, I personally, along with our company, are trying to do to 
you know, help uh, some folks move forward. Great. That sounds absolutely fantastic. We'll try to get some uh, links in the comments as well. So once we wrap up the interview, if you want to just double back and make sure that we've got everything right, and if there's anything else you'd like to add, uh, we would absolutely welcome any of that. So uh, uh, some great, great resources. Uh, sounds like you're working on along with some uh, uh, very valuable uh, uh, artistic shows coming out to the area too. So just uh, uh, thank you so much for all you're doing indeed. So um, I'm curious, uh, on a personal note, do you have any uh, tips or tricks for helping people stay sane mentally and physically during all of this? Um, sure. I mean, none of it's uh, <laughs> revolutionary. One, I will say I'm a big um, I'm a mental health advocate. Um, literally at the start of all of our weekly meetings for my company, that's the first question is always, how is your mental health? Um, because I think talking about that, um, should be regularized and not stigmatized. And so I thank you, you know, for this question. Um, so one, if you, if you need, if you know you need therapy, uh, please, please try to do that you know, and, um, and, and, you know, I feel like that's something that you don't really see people reaching out for making GoFundMes for that, you know, like, actually, you know, if you can kind of get this, this part um, going, a lot of other things, um, you know, become more doable. And I think particularly in this time we're in, like all, all measures, so depression's up, anxiety's up, people who uh, might have more severe uh, mental, mental health challenges, um, you know, like that might be aggravated. So I think there's no like shame about, you know, going to see a professional. And also it's just a reminder, as great as our friends and communities are and our churches are, um, they, they are not the same thing. Um, so if, if you hear this and this is you, please, please, please make that, make that appointment. And if, uh, and if, you know, finances are a challenge, like so many mental health professionals are being very flexible right now and, um, trying to be flexible with fees and getting help, um, that people need. So, um, that's, so that's one. Then two, uh, I meditate um, uh, daily. And so I'm a huge fan of kind of meditation practice. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like this crazy thing. I used to think like it had to be this huge elaborate thing. But it can be as simple as like when you wake up spending five minutes and like expressing gratitude um, and, and thinking about like what you're grateful for. And, and that's, you know, just a great tip for anyone. Like there's so many studies, like if you have a gratitude focus, you're going to be happier, you're going to be more productive. <laughs> um, there's just something about being thankful for, for our life that is uh, really helpful <laughs> for our humanity. So um, yeah, those are, those are a couple of things. Great insight, great information indeed. All right, Daryl, this is probably the most important question I have for you today. How and where can we find you, keep up with your activities, and uh, know what's going on with you artistically and uh, professionally? Uh, yes. So first, uh, definitely follow Gossy Gossipian Investments. Uh, we're on Instagram at Gossy Culture. I believe that's the same thing on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram at the Kingfish08. You can find me on Facebook as well under my name and Twitter under my name. Um, and yeah, I think those are kind of the best ways to keep in touch. Um, I, uh, I just always say uh, check out the Dallas Morning News, read and subscribe. Um, uh, Shed has some articles coming out pretty soon in their fall preview. Um, and yeah, I like, always like to say I'm not a hard person to find. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that is some great information. Uh, Daryl, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I, uh, uh, I finally got mine plated as well. So there are my uh, okay. uh, jalapeno chicken sausages. Oh, those look good. They're not too bad. I threw a few that chips on good. there as well. <laughs> I that just, looks good. I just mash the buns together. Uh, that's the the beauty of the uh, of the camera makes it look a lot better than it might if you're here in person. So, <laughs> well, I'm definitely I'm definitely gonna have to try that that uh, that, that garlic. I'm uh, not garlic. That jalapeno chicken sausage. Uh, um, I did some chicken sausage a couple weeks ago, uh, but it was. But I think with like that added spice, like ooh, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, Trader Joe's has won me over during the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> they've got a, some nice good treats in there that um, um, hopefully will uh, make me a uh, healthier person, at least physically. So, <laughs> all right, Daryl, awesome, any other awesome. words of wisdom or final thoughts for our viewers out there? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, like this is a great time to, to like be kind to each other. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, be kind to each other. Remember that uh, Black Lives Matter and to support uh, queer Black women leadership. And that, um, you know, if you're an artist, uh, what you do is important, you know, and we need you to get out of uh, the state that we find ourselves. So I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for artists. I'm rooting for everyone Black. And um, thank you. Absolutely. God bless you, Daryl. You're doing some great work. Please keep it up. And uh, please take care of yourself and, and, and stay safe as well. So we need uh, more people like you out there. And uh, God bless you. And thank you for everything you're doing for us. Uh, keep us posted. Thank and you. We'll, uh, we'll be checking on you as well. All right. So we're just so appreciative of you joining us, Daryl. And uh, that does it, ladies and gentlemen, for another episode of our box lunch program the holiday is coming up so we'll be back on september 7th i believe is a monday and uh we look forward to seeing everybody out there as daryl said be kind to yourself be kind to those around you uh take care of yourself guys have a great week everybody and uh we'll be seeing you again soon bon appetit everybody let's try mine out here daryl and see how i did all right <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Take care, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.